Hello, my name is Gurima Satija and welcome to 100 Days of Labour, Big Zero Show Online. Today, we're talking about policy. Now, policy is that thing that really ties everything together. We can't really talk about the industry, the infrastructure, the technological advancement without really discussing policy. And the last few years, we've seen a lot of uncertainty with changes in government, with geopolitical tensions. So where are we now? Are we going to be able to reach our net zero targets. That's what we're discussing today. And I'd like to welcome my guest, Rosa Hodgkin, who is a researcher at the Institute for Government. Welcome, Rosa. Hi, everyone. Could you just start with what the Institute of Government does? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a non-partisan think tank. Uh, which is dedicated to making government more effective. Uh, so the way we normally explain that is we don't do the what of policy. So we don't say what policies government should be adopting. What we look at is the how of policy. So you've said that these are your policy aims. This is where you're trying to get to. How can you do that most effectively? What could you do to make that more effective, essentially? So do you advise industries? Do you advise the government? How do you work? Uh, so we mostly work with the civil service and also a bit with academics who are trying to make their research more accessible. We run training programs, we do research reports, we run roundtables, events, anything really to kind of get a conversation going about how to make government more effective. And who funds you? Are you funded by the government? No. So we were set up by David Sainsbury. And we are mostly funded by his charitable foundation, the Gatsby Foundation. We also do a bit of work with partners. So we would work with partner organizations to put on specific events and particularly very occasionally specific research projects, but mostly events. But our core funding is from the Gatsby Foundation. Just to understand, how is your research different from that that the government does or academics do? Why do you use it? Essentially, what we do... I would say how, so it's easier to say how it is different from academia, to be honest. Uh, so it's much shorter um, and it's in much clearer language. Generally, our research projects normally operate on six to 12 month maximum timelines. So they can be more responsive to government priorities than academic projects, which are normally, you know, several years. Um, and so it can be difficult to align them with um, what's going on at the time. In terms of how it's different to what government does, I think we're just a bit freer to talk to lots of people and people can be more open with us maybe than they sometimes feel like they can be within government where everything's going to be published. And so I think we, yeah, just have a bit more freedom to kind of look at what's going wrong without that necessarily being a like, you know, that's quite, can be quite a charged question when you're in government, I think. And is it accessible to the public? Can they keep track of where you've where the government's gone so far in terms of what they're recommended? Yeah, absolutely. So all our reports are online, all our events are free to join. Um, they happen in person, but we also always have an online live stream. We very occasionally run private roundtables where we want to have like a very specific group to talk about something, but mostly our events are free to access and all our research is free online. I want to talk about a research paper that you wrote around the time of the election when uh, you were thinking about the barriers that the Labour government would have to face if they were to come in power and how long it would take them to reach net zero. Can you talk a little bit about those barriers and what you think about that now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this work came out of question we were asked about whether whether we thought the clean power by 2030 was achievable and what we thought the barriers to achieving it were, what was kind of slowing down uh, delivery. Because obviously the previous government had a target of 2035, um, which they were not really on track for. So kind of what was blocking progress there. And in terms of what we found, I would say the main one that came up again and again was grid capacity. So there were lots of people saying, we've got all these renewables ready to come online, but there's not the capacity to move the energy around the grid. And I mean, at the moment, the government pays billions to renewable generators to switch off renewables because they can't transport the energy that they're producing. And that's more of a problem with renewables than with fossil fuel electricity generation, because they're generally further away from sources of demand. You can basically build a power plant right next to a big city if you need to, but you can't always put a wind farm there. Yeah. So you particularly with offshore wind, 
end up having to transport the energy a lot further. So that was that's a big problem. The grid hasn't been upgraded for a very long time. It was already struggling and now you're asking it to do something really completely different. So that's a big barrier. And also connecting to the grid. So 2030 is basically five years away now and it's taking years for renewable generation projects to get connection to the grid. So obviously that's a problem if you're looking at trying to do this before 2030. Similarly planning, the planning system, Uh, So for nationally significant projects, I think the average is over four years now to get planning consent. So again, with five years to 2030, that's a big problem. And then the supply chains and the workforce. So obviously the UK is competing against lots of other countries that are trying to do the same thing. The kind of components and care are in quite short short demand. Um, And there's also... The, actually the people who know how to do this um we don't necessarily have enough people who know how to do this to for example build all of the grid lines that we need between now and 2030 so i think those are some real kind of big hard physical barriers like they're like things that are to do with physical materials kit infrastructure and then i think there's been some barriers that are maybe more political or more policy um where We've seen quite a lot of inconsistency when it comes to particularly the messaging. Actually, in some ways, less the policies, although there has been some kind of uh, flip-flopping around phase-out dates and things. But particularly on the messaging, it's been quite inconsistent, which is obviously not helpful when you're looking at trying to get private investment to um, invest in this infrastructure. So there's kind of... There's, there's a range of different things that have been going on, I would say. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that a little bit. You said there's been a bit of flip-flopping and people are sort of confused. There's a lot of uncertainty. Why is that? Is that something that will settle down, do you think, with a new government? Do you think because there was so much change in leadership in the last government that people stopped making any changes? And do you think that that's picking up a little bit? Yeah, so I think all the changes of leadership were a factor. The kind of political priorities of the Prime Minister are quite important in terms of what you can get done in Westminster. And Boris Johnson was quite committed to this. I think most people would say that Rishi Sunak was slightly less committed to this. So that is definitely, when you have kind of those shifts and who's Prime Minister, that does definitely change the kind of level of commitment coming from the top sometimes. So I think that that has been an issue. I think also the previous governments haven't really wanted to talk about some of the kind of more difficult parts of this. So for example, financial and distributional aspects, who's going to pay for it, how are people going to be supported who can't afford to buy an EV or upgrade their home heating. And so I think that can kind of leave you in a slightly diff- a funny position where yep. you're like trying to talk about it, but with while avoiding quite a big area of it. So I don't think that that helped either. Do I think it will change with the new government? I'm hopeful. I mean, they've been much more consistent in their messaging so far. We hear that it is a genuine priority for them. So hopefully, yeah, we should get more kind of consistency in messaging. And I hope that they will maybe start to open up that conversation with the public about kind of support who's going to pay all of those distributional aspects do you think the industry is picking up on that are they hopeful we heard a while ago that everything sort of stopped people aren't really progressing because they don't know what's going on do you think that they're hopeful i think just now it is clearly a moment of flux people are trying to work out what's happening obviously they're setting up gb energy they're setting up the national wealth fund setting up NISO. So I think it's understandable if right now people in industry are a bit like, oh, what's going on? How are these things going to shake out? But hopefully once that all becomes clearer and a bit more stable, that will improve. Yeah. You said in one of your points that you can't really set up a wind farm next to the lines. Can you tell me, just explain a little bit what you mean by that? Uh, Why can we not just set up renewables next to the grid and why can't we just use renewables and change the way that the grid works so you can put some renewables close to centers of demand so for example rooftop solar um could be really useful in hitting 2030 without doing as many grid upgrades but they 
or you could put you can do community energy so you can put kind of single wind farms close to um sources of demand they i think also need some grid upgrades because then obviously you have to feed that energy back into the grid and the kind of local distribution grids are set up are not necessarily set up to handle those kinds of generation sources so they kind of bring their own upgrades that are needed if when you look at the government's strategy a lot of it is based on big offshore wind farms right and because of kind of wind speeds out to sea and things they have to be offshore and then you have to transport the energy from the offshore wind farm into the center so and a lot of them are in scotland Mm. and obviously a lot of the big population centers of the uk are down in the south of england so that also is meaning that energy is having to travel quite long distances do you think that's an issue with planning that we should not have focused so much on offshore and focus more to build things around centres of uh, consumption? I mean, when you look at, for example, onshore wind, part of the reason that the last government made it harder to do onshore wind was because of backlash from minorities in particular communities who didn't want wind farms built there. And even though all of the polling shows that that is generally a minority view, they're kind of very vocal, Those um, that can still kind of delay projects significantly, and that has been a problem. So as well as the kind of logistical difficulties of have you got space to put the renewable infrastructure close to um, centres of demand, there's also the kind of do people want it? Is there local consent for that? I think that one thing the new government is looking at is community benefits. So at the moment, the benefits you get for having renewable infrastructure close to you are quite variable like it depends on the company it's kind of I think it's basically negotiated like time by time right so I think they're trying to standardize that a bit to make it more attractive for communities to host this kind of infrastructure and in terms of why can't we just have all renewables I think the main thing about that is obviously they are intermittent if you've got a few weeks where there was no wind that and you've got a system that's very heavily based on wind and it's also cloudy so your solar's not making very much energy then that begins to be a problem so one of the things that the new government I think is going to do is set out what they mean by clean power which I think is quite important the climate change committee had said in their kind of last progress uh was it their report on energy carbonization they said that they expected there to be kind of two percent gas in the system in the near future because they just thought that that was like the only way to have a stable system that I think the new government will set out whether that's kind of also their expectation and how they're expecting to balance the system when it runs mostly on renewables. Yeah. Do you think that there is a disconnect between what the public knows and what the government says with in terms of have they explained well what what their policies will be, what they're going to do? I think this government hasn't had very long to do that. Right. Um, I think previous governments haven't done that that well. One of the things we did during the research for the report was we looked at kind of previous big energy transformations in the UK. And when you look at the ones that happened in kind of this 1960s and 1970s, when they were building 1950s, where they were building the super grid. So when they kind of rebuilt all of the grid network in the UK and when they transferred everyone's appliances to natural gas after natural gas was found in the North Sea. Things like the nationalised gas boards were running massive information campaigns yeah. um, and holding public meetings and really like the public engagement was very intensive. Um, and we haven't seen anything like that on this at the moment. So I definitely think it would be useful for the new government to have a kind of more active public engagement strategy um, for how they're going to explain all of this to people. Yeah. Do you think on the flip side, the public is asking the government to to tell them more, to spread more awareness, things like that? I think it's difficult. I mean, all of the polling shows that people are quite concerned about this yeah. and that people are noticing the impacts of climate change that are starting to hit. So I think the government is in a good position in that people understand the need for this. They've kind of won that argument. I think when you look at the polling, it's a bit less clear maybe that people have engaged with what they personally are going to need to do and the costs of that in terms of changing how they heat their homes and how they drive and all of those kinds of things yeah so I think that's maybe the area that needs more work the other big thing that comes up is funding do you think that 
there is a lack of funding. A lot of the industry often says that any tax incentives that did exist are either now stopping or there's nothing new. And that's why the industry isn't progressing as it should. Do you think that's the case? I mean, the government has put in some more investment through the latest Contracts for Difference auctions to support new technologies after the last one failed because industry said that the prices were too low. So they have put more money in. This one seems to have been more successful. There have been more successful bids. Obviously, they're also putting in new investment through the National Wealth Fund and GB Energy. There is no getting around the fact that the fiscal situation is quite bad. There are a lot of other areas that are in need of investment. When you look at public services, we have another team in IFG who do a lot of work on the state of public services and, you know, they're in a pretty dire state and literally crumbling in some cases. All of this is kind of pushing against also all the other areas that really need investment. Right. Also, when you look at how energy investment has been funded, Over the last few years, it's mostly been through levies on energy bills, which obviously after the energy price crisis became a lot more difficult because energy bills were suddenly much more expensive and paying more money on those was a lot less attractive as an option. So I think what we would say is that the new government needs a more strategic approach to how it's investing. So where it thinks investment is needed and how it's going to fund that, whether that is through levies on energy bills or through general taxation or however it wants to do that, it needs kind of, instead of doing it piecemeal, piecemeal, policy by policy, it needs a kind of general strategy for how it's going to do that. Yeah. Do you think that's possible, continuing levies on uh, energy bills? I mean, the last government did put some new levies on energy bills and there wasn't a massive fuss about it, which I was quite surprised by because I was kind of expecting that um, that would get picked up in the press and that there would be quite a lot of pushback on that. That didn't really happen. So I, I don't really know, to be honest. I guess it also depends what happens to energy bills. They're quite volatile. Yeah. If they came down, then that might become easier. If they went even higher, then it becomes even more difficult. So yeah, I think difficult to say. Just lastly, what do you think the next few years will look like? Oh, that's a really difficult question. I feel like predicting politics the last few years has been very difficult. And I certainly haven't done it very well. When it comes to this stuff, I think, I don't know whether they will actually manage clean power by 2030. But I think that if they stay committed to it, they will get a long way there. And I do think... That is quite exciting. Um, I mean, it's a much better position than we thought we were going to be in a few years ago. So I think if they do manage that, that will be pretty amazing. That's a very optimistic pick. Thank you so much for your time, Rosa. And thank you so much for listening in. Be sure to check out the rest of the content this week and visit futurenetzero.com for more information. Thank you.